always worship him. Amen? Amen. That's our purpose. We would always worship the Lord as long as we are living. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We praise your name for your faithfulness and for all that you have in stock for us today. Open our eyes to see what we need to see from your word and uh, give us the heart to receive and the mind to comprehend tonight. In Jesus' name and everyone that believes says amen. You may be seated. We're going to be dealing for the next the whole of this month and uh, as far as the Lord will take us on purpose. Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of my life? Why am I existing? What am I in this earth? Where am I living? Why am I living? Help me tell somebody beside you, don't waste your life. See, the purpose of a thing is in the mind of its creator. Like the purpose of this water bottle is in the mind of the one who made it. This water bottle is created to hold water, but not to hold sand. And when you know the purpose of your life, it helps you to fulfill your destiny. We all have been sent on the planet Earth such a time as this to fulfill destiny and knowing your purpose is important and help you in fulfilling what God has called you to do. So a life without a purpose is a life of waste. Repeat after me, a life without a purpose is a life of waste. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to verse 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So it's very simple. The scripture is telling us right here from verse 15. He said, walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. It tells that there are people that go through life walking around as fools. Not knowing how to step. Growing up as a young boy, I, I tend to learn some things. And even as an adult, I've carried it into my adulthood that I'm very careful everywhere I step. When I even step on these stairs, honestly, I take my time. Because I don't want to miss my step and break my ankle. Because I always think my father and mother cannot bail me out of prison if I get myself in trouble. I become very cautious. In every step I take, in the friends I hang out with, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going there. You can't go, I'm not going. Because I, I know if I get in trouble there, I have no one to get me out of trouble. So you're walking circumspectly. Not as fools. Why must you walk like that? Why must you be cautious? Why must you not waste your time? Because time really can be wasted. That's why if you have time wasters in your life, they are your worst enemy. People that like to waste your time, if you can, get away from them. Because you have too much to do and there is not enough time to do it. So it tells us in the next verse, redeeming the time because the days are 
evil. I don't have to explain this. We all know. We all know how things are. We all have to be redeemed time, save time. And I love the next verse that says, do not be unwise, but, that's verse 17, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is God's will for your life? Do you know what it is? What is your purpose for living? Why are you on this earth? Is it just to live, eat, and die? Wake up, eat, go to work, come back home, eat, go to bed, wake up, eat, go to work, come back home, eat, sleep. You know, people just, they live like that every day. They just wake up, they eat, go to work, come back home, eat, go to sleep, wake up the next day. That is just the life. But God have more planned for us than that. If you believe, let your amen be sound like amen. So you have only one life to live. I like to use that phrase. You have uh, how many lives to live on earth? One life. So one day of one day your time on earth ends and eternity begins. So one life to live. And the Bible warns us very carefully, don't waste your life. Don't waste opportunities that you have. Make the best use of your time. That means you must prioritize your life. You must prioritize your life. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Help me say to yourself, I will not waste my time. So the purpose of a thing is in the mind of the creator. So I'm going to ask three key questions here tonight. Number one question, what does God want? He's your creator. What, what does he want? What does he want? What does God want? He must have a reason for placing on this earth. What does he want? Why would he place you here? Why didn't you come out as a goat? Do you think the goat decided, I want to be a goat? No, that's true. You know, sometimes I used to think, I would think like this. I was a man, how come one dog sleeps with the owner and the other dog is kept outside? Did the dog decide I'm gonna be sleeping in the on the owner's bed? No. So, you know, you know what? If, if the dog never care, I'm gonna be a dog. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a puppy. No. That dog was made for a reason. The way it was made. So when God made you, God made you for a reason. So three questions. One, what does God want from you? Number two, what will it take? And number three, why? We're going to try to answer these three questions tonight that will help you to think a little different about your life and the purpose for life on this earth. What does God want? What does he want? What do you think God wants from you? What does God want? Souls, what does God want? What does God want? Fellowship, what does God want? Help me out. What does God want? God does God want? Amen. What does God want? Now let me give you the answer. God wants your whole life. Everything about you. Not half, not a part of it. Your whole life. Say my whole life. Say it one more time. Say, say it again. So God wants your whole life. Look at what it tells us in chapter 10, verse 2, 12 of the Deuteronomy. And now, 
Israel, what does the Lord want? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. With all. Somebody say all. Say one more time. What does God want in return for what he has done for us? We see in the scripture, to fear the Lord, reverence, respect him, honor him, honor his authority. What does he really want? He wants the whole of your life. He wants everything. Chapter 8, proverb. Verse 8 talks about... All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. Of course, you know, we know God hate evil. Chapter, uh, that's chapter 16, verse 6. Depart from evil. Chapter 16, verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. But um, by the fear of the Lord want to depart from evil. So, of course, you know, God wants us to depart from evil. Amen? Amen? God wants us to depart from evil. So, what he wants, he wants the whole of your life. He wants you to, to have respect for him, to fear him. That what fear is respect. Reverence him, honor his authority, and then walk in his ways. Follow his pattern and purpose for your life. You walk in the ways of God. You follow his pattern and you follow his purpose for your life. What does God want? He wants you to love him with all of your heart and all of your soul. Your heart is your spirit and your soul is your mental faculty. Love God with all of your heart. And everything that is within it. No, but the other one, you have to serve the Lord with all your heart, your soul. What does that mean? You place, your, make yourself available to him to advance the interest of his kingdom. You serve God with all of your heart. You serve the Lord with all of your heart and your soul. God wants all your heart. God wants loyalty. God wants you to, he wants to be first place in your life. God doesn't want to be second place. There are some of us that don't mind being second place, but God doesn't want to be second place. He wants to be first place, first place. What do they say first place? See, God will never take a second place. God doesn't want to have uh, a to be somebody who is competing with somebody else over you. He wants everything. Say, God wants everything. He wants my life. He wants my soul. He wants all of my heart. He even tells us in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and riches. Look at what it tells us here. No, no one can serve two masters. You either will hate the one and love the other, or else you would hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. No man can be the same, have the same loyalty to two different people. You understand that? So you cannot, I'm loyal to STBC. I'm also loyal to BSYZ. It's not possible. It is not. There's always going to be one or the other. Amen? So you, okay, oh, God help us. So what you have to, have, so God wants our complete loyalty first place. And every other thing should come second he wants to be the master of our life. He wants to have supreme authority. He wants to have the final say. Final say. Final say. 
Say no one say cannot serve two masters. Cannot, cannot serve God and serve my mom. Cannot means absolutely impossible. Are you with me? It is not possible to serve two masters. Thank God in, in this culture, you know, uh, polygamy is not accepted. Because you cannot love two men and two women equally. Or is it possible? I hope none of you have two or three. You are laughing. People do. But thank God it's not you. Amen? It, it's not going to be possible. You're going to love one and have the other one on a standby. Oh, that's right. And people live a double life all their life. Just not consistent. But you cannot love God the same way and say, I also love the devil. No, you're going to choose one. So he said you cannot love God and cannot serve God and serve mammon. Mammon is a, uh, it's a spirit that controls, uh, that empowers and controls money. So God wants all of your life. Say God wants all of my life. Not 10%, not 20%, not 50%. He wants all of my heart. Completely. You see, there are many that want to serve God in, the spare, in their spare time. You cannot serve God in your spare time. Do you know there was a lady that came to church many years ago? Maybe months, I don't know if it's months or years ago. Maybe it's months, I don't know how. The lady that we, we spoke to, she said, no, I'm too busy right now. Months ago. She came all excited. We call up. What happened? Right now, I'm too busy. I have things I don't want to take care of. When I'm done with all of my business, then I will start. I will then begin to serve God. I say, wow. She does not understand. And the saddest thing about this lady is that she came from a culture where she got this teaching that you are hearing today. Certain cultures you are taught this as a child is ingrained in your psyche. So there are no two ways. God is everything. There is no. So she knew this. And to come here and say, I want to do this thing first, then I will come to God is just absolutely insane. Because, we, because she was never taught like that. She was never brought up like that. So in some cultures, you were just taught is God and God alone. Amen. That God is beyond anything. God is more than your husband, more than your wife, more than your children, more than your job. God comes first. And I'll say it again, God comes first before anything in your life. Don't mind those who try to put God second. If God even comes before your wife. He comes before your husband. He comes before your children. He comes first. Because I, I, I used to tell them that if God comes, God called Abraham. If Sarah refused to go, Abraham would still go. He didn't call both. He called one and one must follow. So if God called you, he didn't call two. That's why every man must give an account of himself. To who? So that's why when Adam, when, uh, when Adam began to blame Eve, he got him in trouble. And Eve began to blame the devil. He got her in a bigger trouble. Because everyone must give account for himself. Somebody say another amen. So you cannot serve God in a spare time, but many divide, uh, divide life into parts. How many of you have ever eaten pie? How many of you like pie? pie? Apple pie? Cherry pie? What other, what other pies do you know? <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> I like pecan pie. <laughs> it's sweet too. Plus the pecan. <clears throat> but today's Wednesday, so. <laughs> you know what some people do? They actually, they they divide God like as a pie. Say, God, you're going to just take my Sunday, okay? Okay, God. And even in that Sunday, I'm only giving you one hour and 15 minutes. Lord, the rest of the days of the week is 
mine and the devil. <laughs> they may not say it like that, but that's what it is. I'm going to curse. I'm going to live life like I'm a, the devil's child. But on Sunday, between 10 and 12, Lord, I'm going to be like, our great is our God. Sing with me. But Lord, on Sunday at 1 p.m., Lord, you understand, I've entered into another pie. Now I can talk with the devil. I can cuss anybody out. Say, man, be careful now. I'm not in church right now. You better behave. I'll beat you up. Because though they deal, they deal with God like that, you, you cannot compartmentalize God. God wants all of you. Say, God wants all of me. So you cannot have two people as number one. No. They have to be number one and number two. I don't know if it is, uh, what's, yeah, let me see. Yeah, yeah even in, in the, yeah, I think, I believe in all games, basketball games, soccer, if they tie, they keep on playing until somebody becomes number one. They have to keep on playing. If it is soccer, they will, they shoot the goal. Penalty, 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 penalty. Uh, if they come to be even, they'll do it again until somebody comes one. So God has to be number one. He doesn't want to, to be number two. So God's purpose for your life, he wants what he wants. What does God want, number one? Put it up there. What does God want from you? I can't hear you. What does God want? Want your whole life. Your whole life. Your whole life. So you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and work. You cannot serve God and family or sport or school or marriage. You can't. It has to be God come first. If you put God first, everything will fall in place. Trust me, if you put God first, everything, your children, your wife, your business, your job, will just fall in line. But if you put other things first and God is behind, you'll be in big trouble. But when you put God first, you give him your whole life. Put him before the sport. Put him before the game. I remember when they were young, I said, no, not Sunday morning. No, no, they should know better. Why must they put a game at 10 o'clock in the morning? And I see many Christians who rather call off church every Sunday morning and take their children to the game. Until they say, that's nonsense. If all the Christians says, no, you can put a game at 4 p.m., we're going to church, they will change it. Because, but because they just gave in, so what happens? The game is on Sunday morning between 8 and 12, so you don't go to church. You think they're stupid? The devil knows what he's doing. Now you have to choose, am I going to choose God, number one, or I want to make my child to be happy and get my child out of church until they turn 18. And at 18, you wonder why things are going so wrong in your household. But because God was never mentioned as number one in your house, so the child just does whatever they want to do because God is not number one. But if you put God first and everybody knows, no, in this house, God is number one, they will follow suit. God is number one in your life, in your home. You know, it takes the first place and first place, first place. Somebody say first place. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. See, we all... I mean, if you know that we can make excuses. I mean, I've make, I mean, I've made excuses before. When it comes to coming to church, you made excuses. Not you. Maybe, it's, maybe it's this your sister here. Not her either. All right, excuses. Now, excuses that you made is not new. It's been going on for years, and God knows. God understand. I mean, I mean, if you know that God understand. That you're an excuse maker. You, you, you know, he knows where you are. Look at what it says here. But they all with one accord, look at that, began to make excuses. All of them. It's not new. Should I say centuries? 
What is century? Hundreds? How about if it's thousands? How, how do you say thousands? Oh, many centuries. <laughs> eh? Millennium. Millennium. Look at these guys. They all in one act. That means they all excuse the same time. In agreement. The first one said, I have just bought a piece of land, man. I got to go see it. I just bought a new house. In fact, I closed on the house this morning. Let me go check the app. Let me make sure everything is fine. Really? Jesus said, follow me. He said, no, Jesus, I know I love you, but I just bought a new house, a new field. Let me go. I must go see it. Must. I ask you to have me excuse. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to, I just bought a new car. Let me go for a ride with it. I like the Sunday morning ride on the street of whatever you are located in. You know, but the thing that so the excuses continued, and I asked to be excused. Still, another, I have just married my wife, and I cannot come. Why well, not come with your wife? Or some would say, I just have a guest that came out of town. Come with them to God's house. No, you, see, you must understand how the enemy tries to trick. And 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 Jesus said, they all began to make excuses. Let me first go do this first. After what, I'll follow you. They make excuses. They, they decline. They put off another day. They avoid the issue. They cannot have God first in their life. Now, let me ask you, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? What is your excuse? Is it wealth? Is it work? Is it just life? Maybe it's your wife or children? Or money, what's your excuse? I mean, help me ask, let me help me out. Ask the person beside you, what's your excuse? Answer them, what's your answer? What's your excuse? And what, 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 ask the next one, what's your excuse? <laughs> Actually, you have none because you are here, amen. <laughs> You're watching me online, what's your excuse? What, why are you not here? What's your excuse? What's your excuse? I have a headache, and so what. <laughs> You're gonna go to work tomorrow anyway, you know. So, but the excuses abound. People will always make excuses, and Jesus, I just love the way the Holy Ghost does. He's not gonna force you, all right. And if you go to the Old Testament, it's, even, it's a different ball game as well. How, how, like Abraham, I mean, not if you know, Abraham was called by God to leave his household, and the Bible says he left. He literally left. No wonder is the father of faith. Abraham, leave your father and mother, leave your comfort zone to the place I will show you. That means he does not even know where he's going. Just follow. That's faith. He had no idea where he was going. God said, leave everything and follow me. How about, how about the fishermen, Andrew and Peter? Have a, a thriving business. God said, drop your net, follow me. I'm going to make you catching different kind of fish now. You'll be fishers of men. Follow me, follow me, follow me. God begins to reveal his purpose. God, God reveals the, his purpose to you when you begin to follow him. Somebody say amen. amen. But they make excuses. And we read the scriptures, uh, chapters 3 of Proverbs 5. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That is in verse 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Acknowledge him. Know him. Be intimate with him. He will direct your path. He will make you he will, he will make straight and he will make your path to prosper. Amen. God wants to direct your path. What does God want from you? The whole of your life. He wants everything about you. Everything. Somebody say everything. Everything about me belongs to God. Second question, what? Second question, what does it, what will it take 
What will it take to fulfill what God really wants? What will it take? Everything. What will it take? He wants everything, but what will it take? Sacrifice. Obedience. Help me out. Dedication. Huh? This is, huh? Faith. Huh? Humbleness. You, you are looking down. Lift up your head. Oh, ye gates. <laughs> and the he lifted up the everlasting doors. So the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? Lift up your head. Sometimes the Asking questions. <laughs> so, so you are not called, but that's okay. It will take discipline. Say discipline. It will take discipline to give to him what he wants from you. Discipline. I think of discipline. I just thought about our sister here, uh, Suki. You know, you have this program we have here every Wednesday at 5, 6 o'clock, 6 to 6.45. It will take discipline to exercise for 45 minutes. Many of you know it takes discipline. Many days I go for a walk. I don't feel like it. I, would, I don't want to do but But I got to do it. Not because I want to. Some of you enjoy But I rather just lay down. Because I'm stronger than yesterday. <laughs> Amen. Somebody said discipline. First. Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. Exercise. Exercise yourself towards godliness. Reject profane and old wise fables. You know what that means? You know what that means? Go to, let's look at the NLT or Amplified. Avoid, reject, reject. People that are trying to make you argue and start talking, just reject it. Reject profane and old wise fables. Don't waste your time arguing up over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Don't waste your time. People bring in stuff that is so irrelevant. Don't waste your time. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Exercise is discipline. Prepare yourself. Train yourself. Discipline yourself. It's like somebody preparing for an Olympic game. They train. They discipline themselves. Or preparing to minister in such a great place. You, you prepare, you train yourself. Maybe you, you fast and you pray. Because you are training yourself to be the best you can ever be. Amen? And it tells us if you must follow what God really wants, you got to train yourself. You got to exercise Discipline. Somebody say discipline. You have to keep yourself spiritually fit. You know, the Bible tells us that bodily exercise is okay, but spiritual exercise is more important. Discipline. But refuse and avoid irrelevant legend, profane and impure and godless fictions, mere grandmother's tales and silly myths. Express disapproval for them. Train yourself towards godliness. Keeping yourself spiritually fit. Stop all this nonsense arguments that just waste your time. Things that are so irrelevant to your future. People want to just waste your time asking wrong questions that promote argument. Don't waste your time. But exercise yourself towards godliness. So you're going to require discipline if you must be more like God. Godliness means being more like God. I'm not forced for that to be more like God. That's what godliness means. Be more like God. So discipline is formation of habits. What you do habitually reveals your real character. What you do all the time that becomes your habit. Not what you do once every six months. I mean, how many of you go on fasting here 21 days in January? How many of you know it was difficult the first time you did it? It seems like you're going to just die. 
fast, not eat for one day, then 21 days. But the second time he did it was easy. The third time, even the fifth time, oh, that's easy. You're ready. You, you, you can't wait to fast because you have so you are so you've so exercised, you've so trained yourself that you can fast now for even for 21 days with no food. But the very first time, fast for a day, one day, no food. Pastor, please. No food? No, no. No. Is, is it in the Bible? No food. But Jesus was eating, is it in the Bible? It's in the Bible. But see, but the more you train yourself, the more it becomes a habit. Becomes easier. Becomes spiritually fit. And to change your life, you must change your habit. You must develop new habits. Because your life is shaped by the habits that, you, that, you, that you've developed. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does easily besets you. Lay aside every weight. Anything that hinders your best performance, lay it aside. Whatever that makes not to be the best of you, lay it aside. If it's the ice cream, lay it aside. Uh, if it's the pecan, pecan butter, what do you call it? Butter pecan pie. Your favorite. <laughs> it takes some discipline, man. When you have the thing you love the most, like, no, you can't have it. I mean, if you have ever disciplined yourself over something you really like, like you feel like cursing them out. Then you just <laughs> God help us that whatever is in you have to be raised by the word of God. <laughs> it should still not be in you, but there are people that are still there, you know. And it's like if you push the wrong button, ooh, their eyes turn and they are ready to, to curse you. I said, I'm sorry, Lord, you understand. God says, sure, I understand. Lay aside. Lay aside, lay aside. Beset, whatever besets you, that word beset is uh, easily, ens easily ensnares us. Like it's, it's like it's a is skillfully surrounding. So the enemy knows I strategically place things around you that, that makes you always fall. Like every single time is 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 a craft, it snails you. It starts it stands around to have an advantage over you. Lay it aside. So we must develop habit in your in our life if you're going to follow God's way. I'm going to show you some ways to do this. Develop some habits. Good habits. Because you must not live a life of waste. You must not waste your time in life. You must live a life of purpose. Your life must be driven by purpose. You must know why you are here and you must live that life fulfilling your destiny. So I'm going to give you two or three things where to develop habits in your life. You need to develop habit. Number one, you must have the habit of letting go. Letting go, letting go, letting go. Let, letting go. Because if you hold on to things you must let go, it limits your growth. Let it go. Help me tell the person beside you, let it go. Third, the next one, let it go. No, they've offended you, they've messed with you, but let it go. You can't hold on to the past. Let it go so you can enjoy a life of ease. You can't keep on struggling with that same stuff. Let it go. That sin that easily besets you, let it go. I have the habit of letting go. You must learn to say no. Let it go. 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 Let the offense go. Just let it go. Let it go. Whatever I think that way you done, is it money? Let it go. Let it go. Is it fear? Let the fear go. Offense? Let it go. Relationship? Let it go. 
whatever, let it go, let it go. Say, let it go. Because if you're going to fulfill your destiny, you cannot hold on to every single thing somebody has done to you. You would not be able to live your best life. You're going to be struggling a life of struggle. You are holding on to offense, holding on to some sin, holding on to some evil things that are done against you. But you must learn to let it go. Say, Father, help me to let go. I know it's difficult sometimes to let go if your identity is tied to it. If you think your survivor is dependent on that thing, no, no. The Bible says you have been crucified with Christ. No longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. Let it go. Number two, habit. Habit. Habit of letting go. Number two, habit of building godliness. What is godliness? Being more like God. So there are three habits we must learn to form in the next 40 days or 60 days. We have 60 more days to the end of the year, but I made it 40. Did that give you another? Maybe just put 60 days. I was counting many days till this year ends 60 days. So form, build a godly habit. So there are three things I would like you to put up practice. Number one, read your Bible every day. Is that easy to do? Do we all do it sometimes? Read the Bible every day. One. Number two. Learn a memory verse every day. Just one verse. It's habit. Number three. Attend weekly services. Come to Bible studies. Come to small groups. Come to home church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Maybe you have to let go of watching too much TV because it takes your time from reading the Bible. See, there's always a cost to putting God first. Always a cost. It's going to cost you something. It's never free. When you put God first, something has to give. Because you cannot have him and that thing. It's either God or mammon. You can't. It doesn't mix. It's like trying to mix water and oil. They don't mix well. So you have to form this habit in the next 60 days or the next 40 days, whichever is, whichever is easier for you. But you need to understand that if you do something consistently, you're going to be more like him. Somebody say amen. Now let me give the third question, try to get with this. Why should I do this? Why should I do it? Why must you let go. Why must you develop a godliness, building habit of godliness? Why must you give your whole life to Jesus? Why? Somebody say why. It's easy. Why, why, why? Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 15. He died for all. He died for all. How many did, did, did he die for? He died for how many? That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Did Jesus die for you? So the life you are living now is not for you. It's not for him. Because if he really died for you, then your life should be for him, not for you. That's how we, we, we are, that's why we are where we are today. Because we realize he died for us. And whatever thing he asks us to do, we just do. Because he died for us. So my life is for him. 
I'm not living for me. And God knows. If God tells me now to do this and live, I will just do. Because I'm not living for me, I'm living for him. If he tells me give of all of my substance, I will do it. If he tells me leave my job and travel to Senegal, I will do it. If he says go to China and preach the gospel, I will do it. Because I'm living my life for him. It's not for me. So whatever he asks me to do, I will do. And that shows God that really that he owns all of your life. No longer I. Before Jesus Christ, we are all self-centered. You live for you. And for when Jesus comes into your life, you now live your life for him, for him. You live because he died for you. It cost Jesus Christ to die for you and for many others. It cost him his life. Now, now you have new life in Christ because of what Christ has done for us. So now you have a new purpose. New purpose. Your new purpose now is to please him. Please him. What makes him happy? Now you are called the ambassador of Christ. Look at verse 20. Now you are Christ's ambassador. Chapter 5, verse 20. Now we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God was pleading to us that we should be reconciled to God. Now we are his ambassadors. So now we have we have sense of gratitude. Sense of responsibility sense of purpose because now our life is for him so now you have you are living a purpose driven life a life driven by purpose to serve God with all of your heart to serve him to live for him to think about him serve him with your heart Serve him with your substance. Serve him with your... Whatever God has given to you is for you to use to serve him. Not for your own self-consumption. If he gives you money, it's to serve him. If he gives you good health, it's to serve him. If he makes you prettier than anybody else, it's to serve him. If he makes you more fit, it's to serve him. Whatever you have been endowed by God, is to be used for the service of God. Amen. Let's recap on this. Are, are you blessed tonight? If you are blessed, say, I am blessed. The purpose of my life. God wants all of your life. Everything completely, not half of it. You're going to take discipline. You have to do it because Jesus did it for you. That's easy, I believe. He wants all of your life. And we need to discipline ourselves to, to follow him. It may not make sense to others, but definitely it's what we all must do. No one can do it for you. You do this thing by yourself for him. Because he did it for you. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you once again tonight. Lord, we know in our own self and ability, we cannot do it. We need your help. That for all we've received tonight, oh God, give us the ability, give us the strength, give us the will to follow true. Help us, oh God, that our life never remains the same after hearing these kind of messages, that we develop new habits, oh God. Reading the scripture and coming to church, Bible studies, home church. Reading daily devotions and, and just attending services, Lord, and, and just memorizing the scripture as a habit that will help us towards fulfilling our destiny and purpose on this earth. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless your name for it. In Jesus' name and everyone that believes says, Amen. 
You blessed tonight? If you are blessed, I am blessed. Right, let's, let's receive the offering, those of you who are giving online. The instructions are right on the monitors. Those who are giving online, wherever you are, connect with this ministry through your giving, and your life will definitely receive an amazing uh, lift. Because your gift gives you a lift. Amen. Lift up your offering. Father, we thank you for the offerings of your people. I will lift it up to you and before you. We thank you, Lord, because we know you accept our offering as a sweet-smelling uh, 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 fragrance. Lord, let it, let it be used for the advancement of your kingdom. And let all those who are giving receive bounty for harvest for the seed they have sowing. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just come and give your offering as the song is playing. And I will be closing shortly after that. Shall I lay my head? Oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. is running after us. As we chase after you, your goodness is chasing after us. So Lord, we thank you and we are grateful for that. As we go home, lead us by your spirit and bring us back here again, even on Sunday, for another supernatural time with you. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, on Sunday is the very first Sunday in the month of November. Yes, you want you want to be here. You want to be here. You want to be here. And if, if, if this is a very first time being with us, I know I see some new faces. Maybe they're not new, but um, first time, thanks for coming. God bless you. First time, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Another first time there, God bless you. And... Uh, we would love to see you back on Sunday morning. We have a special uh, time to spend with you. It's, 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 it's usually an amazing time on Sunday. You know, every, it's Sunday is usually amazing. So please come back on Sunday. It starts at 10 and we are done around noon. Amen. God bless you. See you back Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen.